Hello friends and welcome to Zionville, the form and function of the Feast of Israel today. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us as we study this most important subject. We do not want to blaspheme what you have written in this area or any area, so please help us to pay attention. Be with me as I speak and be with those listening and watching as they do so. And we will thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The form and function of the Feast of Israel today. A kerfluffle is underway in Adventism, including in the One True God movement, over the feast days of Leviticus 23. It has been going on for a long time, but it is getting a little old, going around and around in endless circles about something that belongs to Christianity 101. The truth of the matter is really so simple that it absolutely boggles my mind that people can get so fouled up over it. Simply stated, are the feasts seen in this slide to be kept today as religious observances and duties by Christians, by anybody? There is a vociferous group that says yes, they are quite insistent about it no matter what scriptures or spirit of prophecy passages you show them and they proceed to twist them and others around to suit their viewpoint. We will look at two such twisted passages at the end of this study, so stay tuned for that. Feast keepers think that they have great light that the rest of us are blind to. We'll see. Or is the answer to feast keeping no, that the feasts are not to be kept today? And what does kept mean anyway? The truth is to be found in the how and why of the feast days, both in the, great, the past and the present. When you get this point right, the answer is both yes and no. Does that sound contradictory? It isn't. We will be talking about form and function in this video, as I said in the title. Then you will see what I mean, and I will try to keep it short and simple, because it is. So first, let's talk about keeping the feast. What exactly does that mean? These feasts are part of the law of Moses, meaning the Old Testament Jewish religion, the ceremonial law. While the Ten Commandments are the law of God because he wrote them with his own finger on the two tablets of stone, which were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant, the law of Moses, given from God but written down by Moses in a book, was placed in a pocket on the outside of the Ark, it being the instruction manual for the Hebrew people. Till, this, till the seed should come, which is Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 19. Here's what Scripture says about that point. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 to 26. Once Christ did come and died on Calvary, the temple veil was torn in half by the hand of God. Thus God indicated that the Passover was historically fulfilled because Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Type had met anti-type. Sacrifice was no longer necessary as a religious duty as far as God was concerned, although the Jewish priesthood continued doing so until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. They failed to turn their attention to Christ, the Lamb of God. Thus was Christ's historical fulfillment of all the feasts begun at the cross, the rest following in their order. Three were fulfilled that very weekend. Passover, Christ's death. Unleavened bread, Christ in the grave. First fruits, Christ's resurrection. One, two, three. Then 50 days later came the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So Christ's death is followed by his time in the grave, about 40 hours spread over parts of three days, three days and three nights in Jewish reckoning, then his glorious resurrection, and finally, 50 days after the resurrection inclusive, seven weeks plus one day, the Holy Spirit came in power upon the disciples to minister the gospel of the world. And that's why it's called the Feast of Weeks. There were seven weeks in between. That's four of the feasts fulfilled over three days, uh, plus the 50, of course. 
This all happened to cap and complete Jesus' first coming ministry of 33 and a half years. Next come the fall feast, three of them now added to our list, uh, to our last slide. The feast of trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. You can see them down there at the bottom. These feasts presage Jesus' second coming ministry on into eternity. Trumpets is the Advent movement in its Millerite and Seventh-day Adventist phases. Revelation 10 gives us both of them in prophecy. Atonement is the antitypical day of atonement where Christ ministers in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, as did the high priest in the days of Israel. This winds up human history with the investigative judgment of all who have ever lived on this earth. Once that is over, that's it, and Jesus returns to save his holy ones from tribulation and the dead saints of all time through resurrection. Then comes tabernacles, when they shall dwell with Christ and his Father forever in the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and on the earth made new. Thus, in these seven Jewish feasts, which they kept year in and year out before the cross, the antitypes are the actual events of salvation history at Jesus' first coming, and then concerning the second advent. Right now, as the trumpets of warning still sound, Revelation 14, 6-12, and 18, 1-5, we are in the antitypical Day of Atonement, which began in October 1844, with tabernacles yet to be fulfilled at the second coming and beyond for all eternity. Hence, the feasts are no longer kept by God's people as they were kept before the cross. They are, they are not religious duties anymore, not for Jews and not for Christians. Those who try to do so are kidding themselves, as do many of the Orthodox Jews, for instance, who sacrifice chickens today because they realize that they have no sanctuary. Would to God that they would realize that they do have a Savior who already shed his blood for them, Messiah Jesus. No need to be standing on street corners in Brooklyn or Jerusalem swinging chickens around their ne heads by the neck or the feet until they are dead. Then they chop off the head and drain the blood. Sorry, Amy. At least misguided Adventist feast keepers know they have Christ and do not engage in such blasphemous practices. All Adventists and other Christians agree that the sacrifice and oblation has ceased, Daniel 9.27. We have Christ, the antitype of all the types, which is far better. His blood saves, that of sacrificed bulls and goats that could not obtain, obtain eternal redemption for us. Their day is over, Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12. Today, Leviticus 23 has a strictly didactic function now and forevermore, that is, a teaching function only. Thus, the form has changed. Why? Because the fulfiller has come. Type has met any type in Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, our sacrifice and high priest. The Son of God became the Son of Man to do a work for us, a work that neither we nor any mere created being can ever do. But Jesus is the begotten Son of God. Praise the Lord. This is the simple biblical picture that the so-called feast keepers of today miss or ignore so that they might push their own ideas perhaps. God alone knows their hearts, but they major on minors that are not in effect anymore, and to do that is to cause this problem among us and the commotion over it, this constant kerfluffle. It is an insult to Christ and his Father and draws off people from them into a dead end. If not repented of, one can lose one's salvation over this issue. I will not go beyond by saying anything more about that, nor name names, for God is judge. I just pray that they come around again to the biblical reality. Leave behind what God has left behind and keep the rest for our instruction. It is that important, which is why Satan presses it through unsuspecting and otherwise good and respected Christians. Please get wise to his deceptions. So again, the feasts are long gone in their original usage as a religious duty because Christ the fulfiller has come. They cannot be kept today as the Jews did either since there is no temple in Jerusalem. And if they rebuild one and resume the sacrifices, it still won't matter. And worse than that, that will be a slap in the face to Jesus. I hate to see all these dispensationalists already doing that in prospect, thinking they are following God's will. May they wake up 
and the Adventists. Look, when the sacrifice and oblation ceased, Daniel 9, 27, so did the days as religious observances, for they only existed to have the sacrifices on. This is where the biggest disagreement lies among Adventists on this issue, and yet it's simple. Thus, today they do still serve a function, a specific purpose, but a different one for us as opposed to the Jews of Old Testament times namely, a didactic function, as we've said. They teach us about Christ and his work for sinners and the long timeline that his work encompasses. It started at Calvary, and it is still going on. Here is what Paul says about this. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2 and verse 14. This handwriting refers to the ceremonial law, the Old Testament Jewish religion, that Moses wrote by his own hand and put in a pocket, put it in a pocket on the side of the ark, not God's Ten Commandments, which the Lord wrote with his own finger, and which were placed inside the ark. Do you see the difference between the two sets of laws? Then, referring to Moses' writing of the ceremonies, Paul continues in this manner. Let no man deceive you, or no, excuse me, let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink or in respect of a holy, holiday, holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, Colossians 2.16. These are the ceremonial feasts, including the yearly Sabbath days, all of which are done away since Calvary as religious observances and duties. Then in summation, Paul says, which are a shadow, these things are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, Colossians 2.17. They are a shadow of things to come, and since Christ did come as the fulfiller, the body today, Christ's church, looks to him, not the old feast. The body, the church, is of Christ. It can't be any clearer. We are of Christ now, not of Moses. We now have the reality with the shadows only serving to teach us about our Redeemer, which Moses only typified. Think about that. Christ is fulfilling the feast now in the onflow of history, starting at the cross, Passover, and continuing on through the second coming when the truly repentant will go to dwell with him forever, tabernacles. He, not us, nor our ministers, is fulfilling them, which was always God's purpose. We as Christians do not keep them, therefore. But the current use of them, teaching us about Jesus and his salvational work for us, is indeed in force. The feasts are different in form and function from the Ten Commandments as well, don't forget. The Decalogue is eternal, but the feast days were only temporary in their Old Testament signification and usage. And they will never be brought back in that sense. But they are a marvelous teaching tool, and that function will continue. That is our portion. Now, here's just one of Ellen White's quotes on the matter, which makes all that I have said crystal clear. And note the difference she puts between the two sets of laws. You cannot erase this difference any more than one can erase the seventh-day Sabbath and declare Sunday as the true rest day, or the Trinity as against the one true God, when Paul clearly declares that that one is the Father alone. He's the one true God. Read 1 Corinthians 8.6. That is just the way it is. And his, this feast issue is clear too. It cannot be gainsaid except by blind or dishonest people. Now read carefully, my friends. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. What a contrast between the words of Christ and the language of those who claim that he came to abrogate the law of God and do away with the Old Testament. Our Savior, who knew all things, understood the wiles of Satan, the snares by which he would seek to entrap the children of men, and so made this positive statement to meet the questioning doubts and the blind unbelief of all coming time. But there is a law which was abolished, which Christ took out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Paul calls it the law of commandments contained in ordinances. This ceremonial law given by God through Moses, which is with its sacrifices and ordinances, will be 
binding upon the Hebrews until type met anti-type in the death of Christ as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Then all the sacrificial offerings and services were to be abolished. Paul and the other apostles labored to show this and resolutely withstood those Judaizing teachers who declared that Christians should observe the ceremonial law. Christ himself declares that he came not to destroy the law of the ten precepts, which was spoken from Sinai. He says, Verily I say unto you, making this assertion as emphatic as possible, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Here he teaches not merely that the claims of God's law had been and were then, but that these claims should hold so long as the heavens and the earth remain. This testimony should forever settle the question. The law of God is as immutable as his throne. It will maintain its claims upon all mankind in all ages, unchanged by time or place or circumstances. The ritual system was of an altogether different character and typified the death of Christ as a sacrifice for the broken precepts of the moral law. Signs of the Times, September 4, 1884, paragraphs 1 to 4. That should settle it for the non-rebellious in heart, for she backs up Paul and the rest of the prophets to the utmost. One final thing is the twisting of passages, as I mentioned above. Here are two. The servant of the Lord said this. In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. The breach made in the law at the time of the, the Sabbath was changed by man is to be repaired. God's remnant people standing before the world as reformers are to show that the law of God is the foundation of all enduring reform. Prophets and Kings, page 678. It is said that every divine institution in this quote has to include the feast here in the time of the end. But look closely. She is talking about the breach of God's law when the papacy changed the Sabbath to Sunday, Daniel 725. She is not talking about the ceremonial law at all. Then she clearly shows that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, broken in so many ways, is going to be restored. This job is the special purview of the final remnant, Isaiah 58, verse 12 and following, not the feast. Lastly, this one is also abused. Well would it be for the people of God at the present time to have a feast of tabernacles, a joyous commemoration of the blessings of God to them. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 540 and verse 6. Notice, it says, a Feast of Tabernacles, not THE Feast of Tabernacles. Huge difference. THE Feast won't be fulfilled until Jesus comes and takes us to heaven. Until then, and this is the closest thing we, that we can do that the Jews did, we should at present time have camp meetings and convocations regularly for joyous commemoration of God's blessings, a time of fellowship and learning. A Feast of Tabernacles. And the date these are held is not the point. Don't be hung up on that. And don't say people are lost who do not keep the dates. From what I can see, this is what Adventist feast keepers mean by keeping the feast. Camp meetings and convocations which they keep on the Old Testament dates. That part is not necessary. And you are not keeping those yearly Sabbaths either. The religious obligation is done away in Christ. Please remember this. We are of his body not Moses. So don't use abolished Old Testament instructions to make mountains out of molehills today. People are wasting their time and energy, and many may well lose their souls over this when it's all over. We have the three angels' messages to get out to a lost and dying world, Revelation 14, 6-12, and 18, 1-5 for the fourth angel. That is our duty for our time. Let us be busy in doing that, not an endless arguing and debate over obvious things. I hope this has brought some enlightenment on the issue and to perhaps untangle it amongst ourselves. Blessings. Jesus is coming soon. Maranatha.